Hey everybody, it's Lon Seibin and it's time for your weekly wrap up and I want to begin first as I always do by thanking our newest Patreon supporters and we have Greg Singleton and Terry Roadburn who contributed via the tip jar. I want to thank both of them and all of you who contribute on a regular basis as well as everyone who watches on a regular basis too because as I always say, uh, all of those things combined lead to channel growth and we continue our uh, upward movement towards 200,000 subscribers. So I want to thank everyone for your support this week and I'll be uh, cranking away here in the home studio. So what did we do this week? Well, I didn't do all that much on the extras channel this week. I unbagged a couple of flash cartridges for the Game Boy and Game Boy Advance. And the reason is I found an old Game Boy at my mother's house that I had left there from almost 20 years ago. And I figured, hey, let's get some flash cartridges on the channel and check out how those work. So I got two EverDrives, one for the Game Boy Advance. I dug that one up as well as the traditional Game Boy. And I also unboxed the Lenovo Y520 gaming laptop, which I then reviewed on the main channel. And you can see all of the reviews use link below on the master playlist and what I liked about this one is that it's another sub $1,000 gaming laptop that performed a little nicer than the sub $1,000 Dell we looked at a few weeks ago and it has a better display and I think that might be worth its $50 price premium over that Dell device. You can check out the full review and get my full take on it. We also looked at the Edifier R1280 T $99 powered speaker set and I like them for the price. I think if I was an audiophile I probably would want something nicer and more expensive but I think for a lot of consumers uh, this will meet their needs and this is one of those things where I have to look at the product based on who it's being marketed to and I don't think it's an audiophile product as much as it is a uh, product that delivers to consumers better performance than they might see from a comparably priced set of plastic computer speakers. These actually did sound pretty nicely but note the wood grain is simulated on those just like it was in the old days and we also got to look at a prototype of the all controller and if you are a fan of the channel re-res as I am you may have heard about this so Shane Lewis who runs that channel uh, reviews a lot of game controllers especially from uh, the retro days from a lot of third parties and I think he's really developed an eye for what and probably a feel for what works in a game controller and what doesn't and he's taking his expertise and uh, advising a group of electrical engineers on making the ultimate game controller and I think he's getting there with this one. Uh, this is going to work with just about everything out there at least that's their plan and you can configure everything using its screen. So if you're curious as to how it works you can check out my full first look in the master playlist down below and we got to look at the Nighthawk S8000. They call this a gaming switch but I don't think it's going to provide any real performance gains over maybe a $30 switch out there, especially for gamers who uh, typically are not going to max out a gigabit ethernet connection. A lot of times buying a $20 or $30 switch with gigabit speeds is going to be better than just using your Wi-Fi. Uh, this switch tries to appeal to gamers, but it doesn't offer features that I think are any better than what you can get for far less. But you can see my full review and get a, a good idea as to whether or not this might be for you. And now it's time for a couple of things that are on my mind. We are now in week six of my full-time endeavor and this week I went into New York City and filmed some interviews in the uh, New York City YouTube space and their diner set which was really fun to do so it took a little bit of work to get everything set up and I've got two interviews shot there which we'll uh, talk about a little later in the wrap up here and I'm hoping to do more interviews and that kind of stuff and one of the nice things about uh, doing this as a job full time is that I can actually get into the city and uh, do some stuff in that that space there which is a really nice production facility I'll try to do maybe a tour of the place when they're less busy uh, so you can see exactly what is available to folks there but uh, really cool stuff and I believe if you have 10,000 subscribers now uh, you can get into any of the spaces around the world and do a production there I think if you're at 10,000 uh, you can do one production a month and then if you're at 100,000 like I am you can do three a month and as you keep growing uh, you can do a little more at the space but a uh, really nice thing that YouTube makes available to us creators free of charge you just have to sign up and you are in and it was really cool to get back there and do some work over there so you'll be seeing uh, some of those things coming up this week and I also wanted to continue Continue the discussion on YouTube advertising because it looks like there's a lot of things happening right now beyond just uh, YouTube declaring things ad friendly or not. It looks like now the industry, the ad industry, is responding as well and beginning to uh, put their own filters on top of everything, also. So Omnicom is one of these big agencies that uh, tries to filter out content for brand safety. They're now getting into the business of uh, looking at specific YouTube videos and brands and deeming them safe or not. So I think what's going to happen here over time is that it's going to be a lot harder harder for smaller channels to kind of get the revenue foothold that they may have been able to get at maybe a year or two ago, primarily because not only do you have to get through uh, YouTube's uh, hoops to uh, be declared ad friendly, but now some of the industry is looking at uh, overlaying their own uh, bit of this as well. And what happens 
especially with groups like Omnicom and other uh, services out there that try to make things safe for brands, is that they put a more human spin on it. That's not something YouTube has said they want to do. They really want to rely on the algorithms to determine what is a brand safe video or not. And I think advertisers want a little more certainty. So I think we're going to be seeing it really a change in the revenue structure here, but not in the view structure. So I think as people grow, uh, they'll have opportunities. But I think this will start pushing things over more to native advertising where uh, these brands can pick which YouTube channels will talk about their product on air versus a random ad showing up on the video. So it's going to be a really tumultuous time for revenue, unfortunately, for me and many others out there. But I'm just going to stick with it and just see where it goes. I haven't seen, like I said a couple weeks ago, I haven't seen a real uh, reduction in revenue just yet. There is a little bit of a reduction right now, but I think it's just the normal ebb and flow that I've seen in past years. So I'm hoping uh, that there is a survivable path here. And so far, I'm not too worried about it, but I did want to bring this up because I know a lot of you are interested in it. And I don't review games here on the channel, but I did want to tell you about Thimbleweed Park, which I am just really enjoying. And this is a point and click adventure game uh, in the style of the Lucasfilm games that I played and enjoyed back in the 90s. In fact, this is written by one of the legends of the point and click industry, Ron Gilbert, who uh, made Day of the Tentacle and Maniac Mansion and so many other fun games that I really spent a lot of hours playing with as a kid. He's come up with something totally new here that is in the same style as what uh, you might have seen at the height of this genre in the 90s with uh, full voice acting, a really fun story. It is just so well done. Uh, it's worth your 20 bucks if you are a fan of this genre. And the best part is it runs on a lot of low-end hardware, including my GPD Win here, so you can just kind of play it handheld if you want. I think they're going to have mobile versions coming out very shortly as well. It's across uh, many different platforms right now. I interviewed Ron Gilbert at PAX East last year, and you can check out that interview on that short URL below the image. And uh, it was a really fun interview just to talk with this guy, first of all, because I had played so many of his games as a kid and actually getting a real feel for uh, where he's seen the industry go because he started as an independent developer making games on floppy disks that he would sell out of a plastic bag essentially to getting hired by a big studio essentially George Lucas's company and then uh, pivoting out to doing it back on his own again through Kickstarter and I really am quite pleased with what he delivered here and if you are a fan of point and click adventures definitely check this one out. And now it's time for some Q&A from you, the viewers. And a lot of you have been asking about the GPD Pocket, which is a uh, Indiegogo campaign from the same folks who brought us the GPD Win. And I'm quite pleased with the GPD Win. I like their uh, GPD XD Android handheld, which I use quite a bit for my gaming emulation. I've been starting to uh, get some emulators working on this Windows device as well. And uh, they were able to deliver on some really good stuff here. I think they've been uh, having a pretty good track record lately. They're not perfect. There was, of course, customer service issues and everything else that goes on with buying something from China, but they are better than most, and uh, they produce some really unique hardware. So what they're doing here with the Pocket is taking essentially the same guts as the GPD Win, which is an Atom X7 Cherry Trail processor, and putting it into this little mini laptop. So you'll get a comparable performance to other Atom devices like the Surface 3, but in a much smaller form factor. So this is what it looks like, and uh, what they're trying to do is give you kind of that laptop look and feel in something very small. I don't think I'm going to be typing all that well on this thing. Maybe not uh, any better than I will on the uh, GPD Win here, which also has a really tiny keyboard. But uh, we'll see what this looks like when it comes out. I did uh, put in my money for this one, so I will be taking a risk on your behalf to see how it plays out. I think it's about $400 or so. And you can see what their uh, internal design is looking like, mostly battery. So I would imagine the battery life on this one will be better than the GPD Win. They're also having a cooling system put in, as you can see there as well, to keep that uh, X7 processor performing consistently. So they have a pretty good design here. They've got a pretty good track record in my book at least. So when it comes in, I will review it. So don't worry, uh, stay tuned. I'm sure it'll be a little while, but when it gets here, I will do a review very quickly. And Robert Delecki wrote in about uh, using a WD MyCloud or a Synology NAS as a storage medium for Adobe Lightroom. And he's wondering which one is faster. And the truth is neither one is faster than the other right now because they're both limited by the speed of your network. Gigabit Ethernet is uh, what you might most likely have on your home network at the moment. And uh, if you are plugged in via Gigabit, you're going to see a max out of both the uh, pro level WD devices like the PR2100 that I reviewed a few months ago and uh, most of the Synology devices at about 
about 100 megabytes per second or so, and that's assuming that the NAS is plugged into gigabit as well as your computer. You're not going to see much uh, better performance on one brand versus the other. It really comes down to features and the kinds of things that you're looking for uh, in the device. I think that's the big differentiator right now. I do think, though, that we're going to start seeing faster networking come to us shortly. I'm seeing now uh, some switches that are now incorporating 10 gigabit uh, connectors on them. So as those things start to come into play, we'll start seeing those 10 gigabit connectors get installed on uh, these NAS devices. And then I think we'll start seeing some of the differences there because 10 gigabits is very fast. And if your device is going to be a little slower, you will see it there uh, versus the current generation of products. But I think we've really tapped out now uh, the speed of these devices. There are things you can do like link aggregation where you can have multiple ethernet connections going into both devices. We talked a little bit about that in our Netgear review this week, but that stuff starts to get really complex. And I think really where it's going to end up is uh, 10 gigabit devices, both on the switches as well as the wiring and on uh, the NASes themselves. But right now you really should be looking at features uh, versus speed because again, at that pro level or the mid pro level, uh, most of these devices now max out that gigabit connection. And Ian Lee wrote in about his router that has been giving him some trouble and that his 2.4 gigahertz band is wonky at the moment. He's not sure if the router is dying or if there's too much interference and whether or not one of these expensive mesh systems like the Lynx's Velop or maybe something less expensive like the Ubiquiti access points might help him solve his problem. And more than likely, it probably is interference. So if your wireless was working throughout the house with just your router and now it's not working, there's a good chance that maybe on the edge of that signal now, uh, your neighbor is running their router on the same channel and that's presenting some interference that's knocking your clients off. So you may want to try looking at changing some of the channels first and see if that makes a difference. And if that doesn't fix it, then definitely consider the ubiquity access points. I, I've mentioned these before in the wrap up and in, in a review that I did. I think they are the best value out there. They are very easy to set up, especially if you have uh, even a remote degree of networking experience. Just really plug them in and uh, run the software and you're done. They are pretty much bulletproof. I've been running them here at the house. My uh, daughter, who's like addicted to Netflix, is able to uh, stream to her heart's content without interfering with what I do on the network. Everyone here has been quite pleased uh, with how well everything has been working since I got those things set up. So I would definitely recommend going that route. And what I like about the Unify Access Points from Ubiquity is that you have a lot of choices in what you get. So I've got uh, their low-end ones, which are more than adequate for my tasks. They have AC, which includes 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi as well as the 2.4 gigahertz so I can segment people on different frequencies and uh, they're good enough for what I want to do. They're two by two access points quick enough uh, but there are faster ones they have available for more money but you can really mix and match things together. They've got outdoor access points too that we'll be looking at uh, later this week. So check out my full review of those down below in the video description because I would definitely suggest going that route versus a mesh system if you are uh, tech savvy or at least interested in uh, setting up things on your own and understanding how they work. The mesh systems are good for consumers who just want an out-of-the-box solution, but you're paying a huge premium for it and losing a lot of control in the process. So uh, definitely check those out. Now it's time for a Q&A for you. And I got this question in from Sam Lazar Gaming, who's got a really cool blue Dreamcast controller, one of my favorite consoles. And he's curious about recommendations for universal remotes. And I have absolutely zero aptitude in universal remotes because I've got a remote for everything and I know what everything does. And I just push the buttons that I want to push and I'm good to go. So if my wife ever wants to watch uh, something on the big television upstairs, she calls me to come and get it working for her. So down here in the studio though, I do have a universal remote that a lot of you might might have seen me use before. And I actually just use it to uh, control this television right here because this is what I use to preview uh, what I'm recording while I am recording it. And I lost the remote to the cheap TV that I use here, this Orion here. Uh, and I was able to get it programmed with this uh, Logitech uh, remote, which I like quite a bit actually. And I think I might get another one of these at some point if my wife really starts complaining about uh, controlling things. The way it works is you uh, plug it into your computer and you program it on the computer and download via USB. This thing is probably about three or four years old. It is rock solid. I drop it all the time, but uh, it still manages to maintain its ability to work and uh, tune the cheapo television here in front of me. But I'd love to hear from all of you as to some of your favorite universal remotes. Uh, so maybe we can help out uh, Sam here in his quest to help out his family. So definitely leave some comments down below. I am sure we will find this a very useful discussion and maybe I'll pick one up to review if I find one intriguing enough. 
So this week, I've got a bunch of stuff on the horizon. I've already shot those two interviews that I mentioned. Uh, the first one is with the principles of the MOCA Alliance. And MOCA, if you don't remember, is that technology that allows you to transit data over your cable television wiring. Uh, they have a standards body, and these two folks are with that standards body. They're actually a fun uh, group of people to talk to, so we'll be having an uh, overview of their technology and some of the things that they've been working on. And they are really positioning MOCA as an alternative to wireless mesh because you do get a much faster back haul uh, from your remote nodes back to your main node because you're able to use your existing cable wiring versus running Ethernet everywhere. And I have found it to be a tremendously good solution uh, that works very consistently. And we'll talk a little bit more about uh, their technology and some of the things that they are offering to consumers. And that interview, that'll be up probably uh, the midpoint of the week here. We also have an interview with a really interesting guy named Seth Marin, who recently published a book called The Power of Positive Destruction. And he is a Wall Street guy that began noticing uh, things that he could make more efficient. And he noticed those things as a young intern and nobody listened to him until one department did. And that kind of set his life in motion. And this is not like a rah-rah success book. He had a lot of success and also a lot of failure too. And uh, was really a very honest look at uh, how any entrepreneur perhaps should approach their business and the things that they need to be thinking about. Uh, and I found it to be a really good read. He was a really fun guy to talk to. And that interview will probably be up next week. So if you are interested in interviews, let me know uh, who I should be looking at interviewing or perhaps the industries I should be focusing on because I really want to build these up more here on the channel. It's not going to become a primary feature of the channel, but I like talking to people. It's great for me to get to know people in the industry, and I really like hearing stories from folks. I know some of you do, but I want more of you to uh, find some interest here, so let me know what I should be looking for. If you are looking to catch up, I have my uh, playlist of interviews at lon.tv slash interviews, and I also have audio versions of those interviews up uh, on my podcast feed that you you can find on iTunes and on Google Play. But we also have products to review this week, including the EverDrive GBA and the EverDrive GB. Those are flash cartridges for the Game Boy and Game Boy Advance. We'll be taking a look and see how those work. Really fun if you are into that platform. I hope to get to this this week, which is the Bevel. Uh, this one almost got to my didn't make the cut video, but I think it, there's enough here to review, but I'm not all that crazy about it. You'll see why uh, in that review. Basically, it's a little laser that you attach to your phone, and it helps you at least attempt to make models of 3D objects, including your face, but it's not all that great just yet. Another Kickstarter that I regretted paying for. Uh, we also are going to take a look at the uh, Outdoor Unify Access Point. This thing can be mounted up on a pole. It's a 3 by 3 access point. It has both 2.4 and 5 gigahertz uh, connections that you can make to it, and we're going to see how good it works outside. So we'll be hooking that up to my deck later today or tomorrow, and I'll have a full review coming up later in the week. And speaking of the week, our channel of the week is one of my favorites here, Game Chasers, and uh, they they are basically, if you ever watched American Pickers, where these folks go out and try to find all this antique stuff living in shacks and attics and everything, uh, these guys are the video game equivalent of it. They do have some, uh, you know, some uh, probably junior high humor occasionally, but they're fun to watch and uh, they have a really good production quality to what they do. And surprisingly, they're uh, under 100,000 subscribers. I've always wondered why this channel is not bigger than it is. And I think if you are uh, interested in old video games, this is actually a fun channel to watch. They've got several years worth of episodes up. You can spend a lot of time going through it all, and it's very entertaining. So definitely uh, check out the Game Chasers and see if we can get them above 100,000 subscribers so they can get their plaque. They certainly have earned it. They've worked really hard on it. Now, if you want to help the channel, you can. You can go to lon.tv slash Patreon and make a monthly contribution to the channel. We also have my tip jar set up at lon.tv slash tip jar. And we have our Plex thing still ongoing, where if you sign up for a Plex account, uh, we get a small portion of that. Even if you don't give a credit card, we still have a small commission we get. And you can also gift uh, the Plex Pass, which is their premium uh, service. And you can gift that to your friends if you already have one at lon.tv slash Plex gift. You can engage with the channel on my extras channel at lon.tv slash extras, lon.tv slash email for my weekly email. I think this is my third or fourth straight, straight week of sending out the email. I'm very proud of myself for that. Uh, lon.tv slash Facebook for my Facebook page where I post some musings from time to time. And of course, my store, which I will hopefully be stocking up uh, towards the end of this week into the weekend. I've got a bunch of stuff over there I got to get rid of. I got more coming. So uh, be on the lookout probably later in the week when I get some time after I get some shooting of some reviews done. I'm going to move on to cleaning up this, uh, this pigsty I'm in right now to uh, get rid of some stuff. And we have my live streams at lon.tv slash live streams for the archive. I'll probably be doing a few more in the very near future as well. So 
stay tuned for all of that. And that is going to do it for this week's weekly wrap up. Thank you all again for your continued viewership and support. I have a lot of fun things that I've been doing here on the channel planned, and I am uh, always eager to hear your ideas and your thoughts and comments. So keep them coming. And that will do it for this week. And this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by my Patreon supporters, including Gold Level supporters Mark Bollinger and Brian Miller. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash Patreon to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.